and we're live. <laughs> okay, hello everyone. Welcome to Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants on this Thursday morning. We have a very special guest this morning, but first my name is Melissa. I'm going to be your host for today out of Toronto, Ontario. And joining us today we have uh, Miss Carol Devine. She's a social scientist and a humanitarian, and she's a member of the Society of Women Geographers. She works for Doctors Without Borders, and she believes everyone should have access to medicine. So she's going to talk to us a little bit about um, some of the civilian ocean cleanups that she's joined. Most recently, it was an all-female sailing expedition called EX Expedition, expedition with two X chromosomes, <laughs> and it circumnavigated the United Kingdom. So they were able to survey plastics and research the impact of pollution on our health and on the health of our ecosystem. So with that, I think I will hand it over to Carol to get started, and then we'll introduce our classes when we're ready for question and answer. Does that sound good? That sounds great. Thank you so much, Melissa. And hello, everyone from Toronto, Canada. I understand a lot of you are in Canada and possibly in the States. And for any other guests joining us, I'm really delighted to be part of this and to share take you on a little tour today of the North and the South Pole and in between to Scotland to talk about climate change, plastic pollution, and how they're interrelated and how we can do something about it. So I might just jump into the uh, PowerPoint, some, some images to uh, share with you. And I look forward to your questions. I'm just gonna jump in. So this picture is a beautiful iceberg in Antarctica where we have the most ice in the world and the North and the South Pole are like our refrigerators and it's like the door is open right now. So we have to really change our behavior and the good news is we're already starting. So I really wanted to go to Antarctica. In, the, in university, I didn't really know about Antarctica but I knew that it was this place at the bottom of the world when I was looking at the globe, and I was closer to the top of the world in northern Ontario, but I wanted to go, and then I found a moment to go, and I was really lucky. Um, but before I t take you there, I want to give a little background about Antarctica to place us, and maybe some of you have studied Antarctica or even been there, but a very small percentage of the world goes to Antarctica, less than 1% of the population. So why is Antarctica so interesting? I don't know if you can read the few words I have, but there it is, that white kind of bitten circle at the bottom of the world. It's an amazing place because it's the highest, driest, windiest, coldest place. And sometimes we don't think of it that way as the highest. It's full of mountains. Many of them are covered in icebergs or, or glaciers still. It has no permanent human population. So yes, people work there and will come to that, but for a long, long time, nobody even over, stayed overnight there. And it's because it's far at the bottom of the world uh, across very difficult seas. And why is it so important? Antarctica holds 70% of the world's fresh water and 90% of the world's ice. We all need Antarctica, even if we don't go there. It was only seen for the first time probably in around 1820, possibly earlier by sealers and whalers and you know, the, the brave people out there in their, in their boats that were wooden at the time. Uh, but really, humans only started to document it and touch it uh, after 1820. And I'll come to when women started going there, but it was over 100 years later, at least. Antarctica is so important because it's like a crystal ball. Antarctica, this ice holds our human history. It tells us when we dig down those big, long ice cores, it tells us our human history. And with these two ice sheets, it's the most similar place on Earth to Mars. So when we study Antarctica, we're also studying ourselves and we're getting a sense of outer space. So really, uh, it was in the 1900s that people mostly, well, male expeditions went because women wanted to go but weren't allowed. But they went for empire, they went for their countries, but they went for science and knowledge. They wanted to see what was there. And this is an image of the Norwegian expedition um, in 1911 that got to the South Pole. And that was a miracle because it's such a, a difficult and uh, cold place. And one of the reasons they survived, these explorers from Norway and Europe, was they learned from the indigenous peoples in the Arctic, where there was a population. 
And that's how they, they survived in part was from the innovations about how to live in extreme, extreme cold, skiing, the food they ate, the clothes they wore. And they, they collected things like penguin eggs. They really, some of them died in this pursuit of science, but it was an important early exploration of this unknown place. Something really important happened that tells us about how humans can collaborate and can change the world. There was something called the International Geophysical Year, where scientists from around the world went and studied in different places on collaborative teams. And the group that went to Antarctica came back saying, there is so much to learn from, from the strange animals there, um, from the land, from the ice. And at that time in our political world, governments were starting to say, ah, oh, that's my piece of Antarctica. That's my piece of Antarctica, Australia, the UK, Germany, the US, we're trying to chop up Antarctica into these bits. But because of this science focus on this region, they said, let's protect this place. This place is important for all human beings. And the Antarctic Treaty was formed. The Antarctic Treaty, I'll get to this photo, but the Antarctic Treaty said we're dedicating an entire continent on Earth to peace and science. There can be no nuclear testing, you can't dump garbage there, and it's for all of humankind. And this is 1969 when the first female expedition went, and they also looked at the ice and the rocks, which taught us a lot. So it became an important place for collaboration. And here are the, here's Antarctica, you saw it with just geographic features. Now here are the countries that are studying there. And they're meant to be studying for peaceful purposes. But we have to be careful because Antarctica also has a lot of riches, a lot of minerals under that ice. But for now, it's protected. So what we know and love, we can protect in the future. So I went up to the far little tip, like the little tail, uh, in 1995 to do a cleanup project. Why was there garbage there? Well, some of it came from the ocean, but a lot of it came from the humans who were sloppy, but also didn't understand that leaving garbage behind has health and ecosystem harms. And I like this picture of the pole with all of the, the flags that are there saying, this world is connected. Why is Antarctica so important? Not only because of the ice, well, because our climate, climate is warming, because our planet is getting warmer and warmer, because of the way we're using resources and burning and using plastics, um, Antarctica is like the canary in the mine. And maybe you know that expression. It's to say that what happens in Antarctica a bit tells us what's happening in the world. And that, that tip, that tail jutting out, is one of the warmest places on Earth when really it should be cold. And also the little tiny krill, the little tiny um, animals that are the cornerstone of our food chain, they're really sensitive to warm water. So we're watching what's happening there. And it's really important that the Arctic at the top and the Antarctic at the bottom be protected. And I told you about those ice cores. Here is two scientists looking at this long, long, long piece of ice. And in it, it can tell us when there were volcanoes, and when we started to burn more of our own and use more of our own resources, but not being careful. So I have to say something about the incredible animals there. And I went to Antarctica three times, once last year and two times in the 1990s. And I did see it warming, but I was also still um, enamored and blown away by the incredible wildlife. And we were lucky to be there when the penguins were having their chicks. So this, that's a chin strap penguin that you're seeing with the little chap, the strap under the chin. And the seals were also amazing. The only seal that's dangerous is the leopard seal on the top right, um, if that's the one that looks a bit um, like it's going to swim into the water. And uh, it has been known to harm humans. So we kept our eyes open. But otherwise, you know, you got, keeping warm is an important thing in Antarctica and taking care of each other. Here's the Russian research station where uh, I did a, an environmental cleanup project. What does that mean? Well, in 1995, a group of volunteers from Canada, the US, Europe, and Japan, we said, we care about Antarctica. We as citizens can go and help say, let's keep this place clean. 
and we joined with the Russians. So there was a Russian station there and next door was the Chilean station and we literally picked up garbage. It was a small project overall, but I think what we did was shine a light on the problem. So there's about 3,000 people in Antarctica, 3,000 to 5,000. In the winter months when there's no sun, there's less people because you know you have to be pretty hardcore to stay there, but scientists and support staff are there. 12 million penguins. And some penguin species are doing a little better with it being warmer, but many are suffering because to get colder, they can only go south, and that's at the end of the world. So we visited the Chinese research station that was there. We live next door, I mentioned, to the Chilean station in Antarctica. And so while we were there cleaning the Russian station, we also had a chance to talk to other scientists from other countries and say, hey, we're here to work with you to keep Antarctica protected and as clean as possible. There's an Argentinian station and the US has a couple research stations. But what they're noticing is the glaciers that were right at their front door are now far in the distance, meaning the ice is melting. And that impacts us because seas get higher and temperatures get warmer. And that means little animals like mosquitoes travel further and breed more often. And then we have diseases like malaria and it's all interconnected. Here's some of the garbage at Bellingshausen Station. And uh, we, you know, we wore gloves and we did what we could and collected barrels and barrels of things like paint chips and fuel pipes and cigarette butts. Uh, and the Antarctic Treaty that I mentioned that dedicated this whole continent to peace and science also said at the time we did the cleanup, we, you also have to monitor your garbage and the way you dispose waste. So it was good timing to say it's all of our responsibility. And I like this image because it, you know, it's, it's a worrying image, but it's also the truth. We're getting closer and closer to animals. These are the, this is my foot and footprints of my colleagues when we went to Antarctica on an all-female expedition and the penguins were there before us. But um, it just says that we are so close to nature and we must uh, respect mother nature. I'm gonna take you uh, for a little bit now to the Arctic, so to the top of the world. And what you're seeing here are polar bear footprints. And I felt really lucky to see these polar bears that we know are under threat too, like penguins, like human beings. But this place is where there is a healthy population. You know, we, we're, we're studying them, and scientists are looking at the polar bears, but at Svalbard, in the top of the world near Norway, is where there are many polar bears, like Canada, like Greenland and Russia. It's there at the top of the earth. And we were closer to the North Pole. We went on a ship than we were to Europe. And it's uh, this series of islands called Svalbard where we did this cleaning project. And I made an art project out of it. I brought back some of the garbage so that we could look at it and look at ourselves. We'll come back to that. Svalbard is really pretty and it's very remote. And the town uh, is called Longyearbyen, and it, it's, it's a small town, and you see people carrying shotguns because you might see polar bears. And you shouldn't just shoot them, you should be careful, but just in case. And we got on the ship, and because there's all these shores, we were astounded by the amount of garbage we saw. There was just pieces of plastic and fishing equipment everywhere. You couldn't see it from the ship, but as you got closer, you saw it and we started cleaning. This picture really moved me. I saw it before I went to Svalbard and it was taken by a Norwegian guy um, called Svenig who was out with his wife, Hannah, snowmobiling and they came across uh, these reindeer caught in rope. They were able to rescue them, which is rare. Most animals die out of sight. So the job of picking up plastic is really important. The intercepting of plastic is important. But what we want to do is stop it from even getting there in the first place. And it gets into us through the water, through the animals. So our human health and our ecosystems are impacted. This is us in this remote place with only walruses around and under those logs that came in probably from Siberia because we're above the tree line there was pieces of plastic everywhere. Here's some of what we found, and I brought home and I photographed. A doll's head. Who played with that doll? Where did it come from? There was food packages and ropes, toys, 
plastic bags, shampoo bottles, and it's now on display at the Canada Science Technology Museum in Ottawa. A friend of mine is a curator there and said, Carol, bring me some plastic from the Arctic. Sadly, this plastic is going to last a long, long time. So any of you in Ottawa can go and see it at the Canada Science and Technology Museum. How long does this plastic last? A really long time. Socks, five years. Plastic bags, 20 years. Those beverage holders are really bad. And disposable diapers. So we can think of ways not to use them and ways to dispose of them better. Okay, we're coming to the end, but we're going to jump to Scotland. I also was really lucky to join this uh, sailing expedition that Melissa mentioned. And the idea is to look, to, to show women in adventure sport, but also to look particularly how plastics harm women's health and human health and how much of it is in the water. Every single place we went to in Scotland, I joined the blue leg of this sailing trip. We were on a 72 foot sailboat and we had scientific equipment on board. And the, a gang of us joined, scientists and some people who didn't sail very much like me before. And we literally picked up samples from the water and we went through it and we found so much plastic. And even microplastics, these little plastics that you can only see by looking through a microscope. Here's some of the plastics we found, credit card, these little blue beads you see, those little things are called nurdles. And they're what's made in plastic factories. They're the beginning of what becomes uh, something, a toy. And those nurdles are everywhere. And they're a real sign of how plastics are getting into our waterways. So why is it important? Well, what we can do is stop the plastics from getting in the water, stop it from animals from getting caught in it, stop animals from eating it, Four out of five seabirds have plastics in their stomachs. And now this is an image of the Democratic Republic of Congo in Africa. And certainly climate change and plastics is a problem everywhere. But I'm coming back to Scotland in a place that is green because the poles matter to these places. These, ma these places matter to the poles. And all of our actions and all of us are interconnected. And as Melissa mentioned, I really believe that everyone should have access to medicine and everyone should have access to water and clean air. But right now, that's not happening. Something important that we know is that climate change and plastic pollution, they both matter greatly. But so too does education. And that women and girls, we know that women and girls having education and having being able to vote and being able to do everything that they can do matters to our planet and actually helps fight climate change and helps the world be a better place. And working together is extremely important. So what's important? This is um, a, a lovely um, design from a group called Parley for the Oceans, a group that really cares about the oceans. And you know, we've heard about recycling, important. We've heard about reusing items. But here's some new ideas too. Not new, but things we've done in the past and we have to do again. Let's avoid things. I say no to straws. I say no to plastics as much as I can. It's hard. So take it step by step. And I'm sure you're all doing interesting, important initiatives. Intercept it. That's what I did in Antarctica, in the Arctic, and in Scotland. Pick up those plastics before they actually get into the waterways. 80% of the plastics in the water are coming from the land. So we may have dumps and garbage cans, but we're still sloppy and we're not doing something right. So we want to intercept it. So while I'm talking about the poles in Scotland, your own neighborhood is incredibly important. Your house, your street, your school, and uh, local is global. And then redesign. I love the innovations. Whoops, jumped ahead there. I love the innovations out there. We're all thinking smartly and differently about how to fix this plastic problem. So just to wrap up, we're losing ice in both these beautiful places, the Arctic and the Antarctic and everywhere around. That's Greenland and the Arctic. And this picture of the line is that big iceberg that broke off. So that just means more water. And in some places, even in the north of Canada, we have water problems. So we have these challenges, but working together, we can solve them. We can learn from the poles, the Arctic and the Antarctic, where we learned about 
from the Inuit, incredible knowledge and the indigenous peoples in the north about how to steward the land. And also in the Antarctic, we learned how to work together to say one place is for peace and science and to say that environmental protection matters. So there's a picture from 1911, an expedition of men who went for science. And, and here's an expedition I did, Homeward Bound, that was last year with women saying, let's, um, let's really elevate the role of women in science and let's shine a light on the world through Antarctica. It's an opportunity. Let's see this in a positive light. Tackling plastic and tackling climate change is a great opportunity for our health and for each other. Thank you. <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you so much, Carol. So I wanted to mention, I forgot to say that we are celebrating um, on February 11th, it was the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. Um, and so last year, Exploring by the Seat of the Pants hosted a full day of Google Hangouts with women in science and exploration. But this time, we're devoting the entire month, all of February, to celebrating amazing women in science, exploration and adventure, and conservation efforts as well. So um, we're really happy to have Carol on with us this month. So I think now we'll get right into questions. I'm just gonna go based on my list here. So we have um, Miss Wowchuck's class. Let's see if, I don't think I can unmute you myself. Do you guys have a question? You guys are in Thunder Bay, Ontario. Yeah, yeah sorry. I grew up in Thunder Bay. Oh, wow, that's awesome. Yeah, so hello, Thunder Bay. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Hello. How long do you think Antarctica will live without getting flooded for like? Wow, that's a fantastic question. Well, we're really lucky we have these scientists called climate modelers. So they're actually saying, based on what we know now, what do we have in the future? And you know what, I can't answer that directly. But I can say that, you know, we're really concerned because it's happening quickly. Now, you saw some of the pictures. There's a lot of ice there. And, you know, it's going to take a long time to melt. But the more we do to slow it down and even, you know, change our ways is important. But, you know, in your lifetime, in your grandchildren's lifetime, there's a few more lifetimes of ice, but it's no time to uh, be complacent and do nothing. So don't worry about that ice for a while, but sea rise is happening. And the more it melts, the more we have a wake up call. Great question. Carol, mm -hmm. you're still sharing your screen. Would you like to show your video so we can see you? Oh, <laughs> sorry. what do I do? Yikes. I think in Google Hangouts there, you can stop sharing. There's an option. Oh, let's do that. There you are. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, Miss Wachuk's class. How about Miss Petreni's class? Do you guys have, I, st I can't unmute you guys either, but if you guys have a question, go ahead. Okay, who's going? Oh, um, okay. Are there, are there any things in place to try and get the plastic out of the water that's getting in our drinking water? Like right. the plastic, yeah. Is there anything in place to get the plastics out? So there's some really, I mentioned a few initiatives, so let me tell you about a couple of them. There's one called Ghost Nets, where sailboats that, and boats mm -hmm. ship that are out there that are, you know, they're supposed to be regulated. They're supposed to not dump. They're supposed to know where their equipment is, and a lot of the small fishing boats don't just want to lose their fishing equipment. Sometimes it happens in a storm. Um, but this ghost net initiative is so that ships look out and boats look out for floating fishing net that would entangle animals and dissipate into the water. And then we eat it eventually. Um, and that's a good initiative because it's saying, let's monitor, let's look out there and let's do something about it. There's also initiatives to change the materials so that it's not fishing equipment and other materials we use in the world are bamboo. And so that we're, you know, changing what's getting into the water. But the, there's, a, there's many, many um, independent cleanup projects and that, that really matters. And um, so there's some of these bigger initiatives. Um, there's even some machines that are meant to go out and, and collect it and they're still being studied. 
Um, but the good news is that people are thinking in, in creative ways about how to pick it up physically with our hands and how to pick it up in greater, in greater ways. But we have these things called gyres, these big circulating, the ocean currents bring the plastics together in about five or six places around the world. And so that's, you know, a challenge for all of you interested in um, science and creative thinking about, you know, how to get those big whirlpools of plastics intercepted. Um, we also have another question. Yeah, that was a great one. How exactly does the um, plastic from like the earth get into the water in such a, like, so like such a great amount? Like how, how does that exactly happen? Thank you. I, I, didn't, I didn't touch on that so much. So the main way that the plastic gets into the water from the land, and as I said, 80% is from the land, it's from us leaving plastic out on beaches. Um, in some countries, they didn't even have a word for plastic or dumps until, you know, the last, you know, you know 40 years or something. So what happens is people just use the, the earth as the garbage can. And because of winds and the, the plastic gets into the waterway. So the majority of plastics gets into the water from the land, from human sloppiness, truly. A smaller percentage is from ships that spill plastics. So usually by mistake because of storms or just carelessness. But I don't know if you heard those little yellow rubber duckies. There's a website called Plasticology and it actually mapped. So what happened was a ship um, years ago build a container full of plastic rubber duckies. And people are spotting them around the world and it tells us where the plastics are going. So, and that, that's fascinating to look at these duckies and some of them were frozen in the ice at the north. Anyway, so that's the second way is from ship spills. And then a small percentage gets in from plastic factories that make those little nurdles that make plastic objects. So they might have spills if the plastic factories are near waterways. And another way that I hadn't thought about until I went to Scotland on this expedition are microplastics. So plastics that we can barely see from our clothing, from our objects, get into the washing machine, get into the water. So even polar fleece, I used to be a big fan because I do this work and I live in a cold country, but polar fleece has microplastics. And as I mentioned, when we looked in the samples in Scotland, we even saw these little fleeces. Were they ours? So those are the four main main ways. And we can think about, okay, how can we how can we change that? Awesome questions, guys. Thank you, Ms. Petrini. Those are great eights in Guelph, Ontario. Thank you, guys. All right, let's see if we can ask Ms. Saladini's class. These are some grade threes in Woodbridge. Do you guys have any questions? Oh, sorry, your microphone is muted. I would just have to ask your teacher to unmute your microphone. There you are. What's the average amount of ice melting every year? Oh my God, that is such a great question. Sometimes I wish I was a glaciologist. That's the scientist who studies ice. The average amount of ice melting a year. You know, I can't answer that directly, but I know that in uh, the Arctic, it's the fastest amount of all the predictions of when the, the summer ice would be lower because what happens in the Arctic is the ice grows in the winter and decreases in the summer. The, the main message I want to give to such an important question you asked is that it's faster than we ever expected. And that's worrying. That's a real red flag. That's a real warning bell because in the Arctic particularly, the fastest place is but the fastest warming place on earth, it's beat all predictions. So how much? I used to know, but I can't tell you off the top, but let's look it up together later on the fabulous Google. <laughs> that sounds great. Excellent. Of course, go ahead. Okay. Why did you start being a scientist? Why did I start being a scientist? Yeah. Okay. Okay. In this. Yeah, so that, thank you. Thanks for that question. Um, I'm a social scientist. So there's all kinds of scientists uh, that, you know, study microbiology or biology or that study rocks or that study astronomy or the ice like glaciers. But what do social scientists do? We try to understand the interconnections. We try to understand the human, the human element of it. 
And political science is also a science that I'm interested in and have studied too. And that is how humans behave with each other, our laws, our policy. So, you know, policy might be no more plastic bags in Woodbridge or Guelph or Thunder Bay or Toronto or New York. Um, so that, that, that science is really important about our behavior and our, and our how we govern and work together. Why did I want to do it? Uh, I think I'm really interested in the earth and I think I love nature. I was really lucky to grow up in Northern Ontario um, where I was out in nature. And I think I also like to think how systems work and how people work together. So that's my science. Um, and uh, I also love art and art and science go together really well too. Thank you. Thank you. Great question, guys. Okay, so my microphone is muted. Okay, so we're going to go to Mr. Stam's grade 11 class in New Market. If you guys have some questions, go ahead. I can't Hi. unmute. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Stam. <laughs> and can you hear us? We can hear you. Excellent. All right, so we're a grade 11 environmental science class. Um, some of them are a little sleepy because it's a little early for teenagers. <laughs> but uh, we've got one question for you okay. over here. Go ahead. Okay. Um, how can we get involved in, like, what can we do to help with the pollution? Like, I love that question. I love that question. So thank you. Um, love it. Well, our sphere of influence. Our sphere of influence. Okay. So our 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 sphere of influence is our our ourselves, our community, our family, our school, our neighborhood. And so you know, do a cleanup. That's that's great. And think about where it's going. Like, so, you know, you can clean up and then leave the garbage bags and then they spray out again. But think about that. But also there's something great that I like. I've downloaded on my phone and it's called a Marine Debris Tracker and it's an app. And even if for some reason you can't pick up the garbage because you're um, in a sailboat or in a car or something, um, you, you say what you see. You can take a picture of it. And even if you don't have data, you can upload the garbage you've seen. And what that helps scientists understand is the, the, where it is, what it is, and it helps us think about solutions. So, you know, there's things we can do with technology, and then we can join in on cleanups. Um, I, I challenge you, you're, you're probably ahead of me, um, many of you in your behavior, but what can we do? We can change the way we are, you know, dealing with products and what we're buying and, you know, that's an incredible way to do it. And um, so these cleanups and thinking about what we do and seeing the interconnections, um, studying, studying it. So I just really encourage you to think, what can I do in my life? And then what can I study? And it doesn't matter what you study. How am I going to be in this world? And think about others and our interconnections. Anybody who's ready to speak? We just need you to unmute your microphone. <laughs> Hi, guys. Okay, go, go stand in front of you. Say hi. Hi. Okay, everyone quiet. I have a question. Go ahead. Why are people using so much plastic and why is the earth getting hotter? Oh, wow. Fantastic. Question. Using so much plastic. You know, my mom grew up on a farm uh, near Owen Sound, Ontario. And she said at the end of the year, they would have a little box with, with plastic or stuff they couldn't get rid of. One little, little box. They would put the eggshells in the garden. They would just, plastic is new. Only in the 50s and 60s did we start, oh, that's my phone ringing. I'm going to ignore it. Um, only in the 50s and 60s did we start using plastic. So that's a human invention. And that comes out of the earth. And we did it because we thought it would make our lives easier. Well, they did in a way. When you go to the supermarket, you don't have to bring a bag in the past. You would just get a bag there. Our food is wrapped in plastic. 
we just we thought it made our lives easier but now we have to turn that around and remember how we used to live and the good thing is it wasn't that long ago that we lived without it that we brought our own cloth bag to places that we didn't have an orange wrapped in plastic an orange has its own beautiful you know clean container in 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 itself so you know our plastic obsession is new and it means we can turn it around and we're already seeing that but again it wasn't created because of badness it was created oh this is going to make life easier for humans now the second question is why is the earth warming so is that is that right yeah so what's happening is when we when we burn uh, fossil fuels so again from the ground coal when we use parts of our earth to make electricity and heat and to drive our cars we're putting we're putting uh, problems into our atmosphere we're we're actually causing the earth to warm through uh, through oh my gosh co2 like carbon dioxide I really urge you to, to do a little session and all of your your grades and probably the grade 11s are already doing it to look at fossil fuel use and carbon use and how that makes our planet warmer and what's happening too is when when ice melts there's less white and the reflection of of you know so there's less there's less white in the world so there's more black and browns and the reflection is also making the earth warmer so there's a few factors but the point is is that all of that warming is harming our ecosystems and us we're having more um, heat stroke we're having more extreme weather events um, because our refrigerators are broken and we've broken them or we're about to um, we don't have regulated temperature. The seas being warmer means that coral is dying. Species are being affected. So wh why is it warming? It's warming because of our behavior. And of course, the, the planet used to, the ice cores that I told you about, warmer, colder, warmer, colder. In history, we have had warm periods, cold periods, ice ages. But because we're using these extractives from the earth, it's going warm, 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 warm. And that's what we want to, to, to turn around. Thank you. Awesome question. Thank you, guys. Let's go to Miss Hood's class. She also has some grade fives in Bethlehem. I can't unmute your microphone, guys, but do you guys have any questions? Hello, Bethlehem. Oh. We see you, Miss Hood. Can you hear us now? Yes. yes, we can. All right, who has a question? Honestly, go first right there. It's really loud on it. Yeah, go ahead. Right there, you can stand. Um, loud. What's your question? Um, how many animals did you see each day? I love that question. So how many animals did I see? So in Antarctica, we landed on this one island called Paulette Island, and it had penguins forever, you could see. So we were lucky that to see so many penguins. And um, we landed on another place in our zodiac, our little boats, and we would see the seals walking amongst the penguins, looking at each other. And um, we saw whales, which was extraordinary, and to hear them breathing. I love whales. And then in the Arctic, there's whales too, but no penguins. Some people get that wrong. But also Svalbard reindeer. So the one that you saw with their antlers entangled, they're a little smaller. And it's interesting to see how reindeer in Canada are different from reindeer in Svalbard because they adapt. They're so adaptive too. Their legs were a little shorter. Um, birds, incredible birds. But I have to say for me, the whales, with the big eyeballs, um, they're so smart. I think I love the whales the most. And in Antarctica, they were almost hunted to extinction. But again, we humans can be great, and we changed our ways, and the whales are protected for the most part. So the animals were beautiful. I love that question. Thank you. Do we have another question? Jaden? Jaden? Really quick, really quick. 
Um, what was the worst plastic that, well, what was um, a plastic that affected the um, ocean? Okay, what was the worst plastic? Right, so um, maybe, maybe I got to thinking when I, we looked in the microscope, maybe it's the invisible stuff. Maybe that's the worst because we don't see it with our eye. You know, so the big things we saw, we saw crazy things like airplane wing and alcohol bottles and shaving kit. Um, I have a website called aquamass, A-Q-U-A-M-S dot org. And on that, I post all the pictures of the garbage I saw, asthma puffers. But what really upset me was when I only saw it through a microscope because that means how much of it is there. And yeah, so, so that, I, that, you know, that shocked me. One more. And you said that was A Q U A M A S S? M E S S. Aqua mess. Yeah. Okay. Um, how long did the journey take? Oh, okay. Uh, in Antarctica, we left from Argentina, which is in South America, and it took a couple days. And, you know, when I was saying the older explorers, it was really hard to get there because the seas are crazy because the warm water and the cold water meet. It's called the convergence. And um, in the Drake Passage, you cross for a couple of days and it's either called the Drake Lake, which means you're just sailing and looking out, or the Drake Shake, which means you might be seasick in your bed. So it took about four days to get to, uh, or you know, maybe two, three days. It depends where you go in Antarctica. In Svalbard, when I had to fly from Oslo, the capital of Norway, to Svalbard, which is a series of islands, and then we got on a ship, and we spent, um, you know, to start to clean the plastic, we could have started immediately. The plastics were everywhere, but Antarctica and the high, high Arctic, uh, it's expensive to get to, and it's quite remote, and you want a good skipper on your ship or your sailboat. Thank you very awesome. much. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Hood's class. So that was every class. I know Ms. Petrani's class has one more question. We have a few more minutes. So if you guys want to unmute your microphone, Great Eats and Guelph. If you guys want to ask your question, go ahead. We, we have one more question, if you have a chance. Yeah, OK. Let's start with, with Ms. Walther's grade fives, and then we'll come back to you, Ms. Petrani's class. How many times does a penguin hatch and what season do they hatch the eggs? I'm not. I'm not. Um, when we were there, they were in December and they were hatching. And um, what, you know, what I can tell you, and again, these amazing questions that I'm not that specialist of that specific scientist, like how fast is the ice melt and how often do penguins um, have their chicks? Um, what was what I can tell you is that the male penguins, and maybe those of you who've seen Happy Feet, <laughs> it's a true story that the male penguins sit on the eggs while the mothers, the females, go and get food for a very, very long time. Um, so it's a real collaborative effort. But again, I can see in December we were seeing the incredible, um, you know, we could see chicks hatching. You had to stay a distance away. So I encourage you to look that up. Awesome. Thank you, Ms. Walther's grade fives. Does Ms. Saladini's class, do you guys have any last questions? Ms. Petrani's class had to head out. Okay. Or maybe Mr. Stan's class, do you guys have another question? We have one or two more minutes. Do we have any more? I do. I have a question. What's your question? Is all good on Mr. Stan's end? Okay, maybe really quickly, Carol, could you tell us about the cultural history book that you co-wrote about your time in the Antarctic? So when I got back from Antarctica, the first trip where I showed you the garbage, where we did the, the cleaning, um, I, when I talked to the Russians about doing this cleanup, they said, we have one rule, you must bring a cook. You have to bring your own cook because you have to manage your own food. Food is so important and it's you know, you need to be sure there's enough food because you can't eat anything there, except in the past people did eat penguins, but that's not allowed anymore. But so the book came about because my co-writer and the expedition chef I went with, Wendy Trussler, who lives in Peterborough, 
we said, you know what? We should tell people about this story that we did. We should tell our children. So we started to write our stories and collect our journals. And Wendy had a lot of the images and the recipes she collected as the chef. And we said, you know these places. We, we were really lucky to go. We should share our stories. So it started as a small project. And then for fun, we called it the Antarctic Book of Cooking and Cleaning because the cooking food is really important. And it's a great way to talk about different cultures and about this, this thing that sustains us, food. Um, in Antarctica, we had the Russians, the Chileans, the Chinese station. So Wendy collected recipes. And then the cleaning was the part that I was you know, leading where we were going to do our best to do a cleanup as a pilot project. So that book came out a couple years ago, and we love talking about it, and we always bring some recipes. I talk at my daughter's class. She's in grade eight, and um, there's a really great bread recipe in there because in Antarctica, bread is really important. So the book was a, a way to share about Antarctic history through food, through science, through images. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I know our classes have to head out, so if you guys want to turn on your microphones, you can say a quick goodbye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Carol. Thank you so much for joining us. That was wonderful. I hope that went well. I'm done. And that absolutely. Awesome. We'll, we'll, we'll sign off. And thank you, everybody who was watching online. Have a great day. Yeah, and bye. That was great. Thank you.